Riot just released the new 2v2 arena game mode, but unlike most of the other modes they make, this one comes out right away with ranked. Once we knew this, we took to the PvE and sent our Challenger Summoner's Rift players to spend hundreds of hours gathering information to learn the ins and outs of the new game mode. The gameplay is extremely deep and refreshing, akin to how TFT breathed new life into League, and we can likely expect more support for this game mode in the future. If you're fed up of trying to catch up with the players that have a decade of experience on you in 5v5, then look no further to the game mode that just might change everything. Today, we're going to be going over literally everything you need to hit the ground running and have a leg up on the opposition. We're going to be covering all of what you see here and more, so make sure to watch until the end. Before we get started though, if you want to improve fast and get the rank you've always wanted, then go to skillcap.com. Stop wasting your time grinding thousands of games only to see no progress. With Skillcap, you'll uncover the secrets to climbing ranks fast that only take a few minutes to learn and can be immediately applied in your next game. The best part is it's completely risk-free to try as you're kept safe with our rank up insurance. If you don't significantly improve while actively using Skillcapped, then you get your money back, no questions asked. So what are you waiting for? Get the rank you've always wanted by clicking the link in the description below. All right, now let's jump into League's new arena mode. The general gameplay takes place over multiple rounds with four teams competing in each match. In the draft phase, you get one ban a piece and then you lock in your champ. There are no runes and no summoner spells that you can choose from. In each round, you'll have a buy and a preparation phase, where you'll be equipping different augments and items before you're split up and locked into the arena to fight to the death against another team of two. These arenas differ in shape and size, and the hazards that appear are randomized between rounds, so there's quite a bit of variety with what to expect. The last one's standing win, and the losing team has a penalty deducted from the team's total health pool. It starts at 20, and when it hits zero, your team is out. Last team standing takes home the win although second place is awarded ranking as well. It sounds simple, but there's a lot that goes into making this a very complex and interesting offshoot of League, most notably the Augments. Augments are basically power-ups that you can equip during rounds. You can get up to four total and you get them one at a time. Once you select one, it's with you for the rest of the game. You can't swap it out later if you decide that you don't like it. The interesting thing about this is that they are completely random and there's a huge list. There's no set build you can go every game, and adaptation is key. If you need one specific augment to be strong, your champ just probably isn't going to be very good, but more on comps later. You're presented with three at a time, and you basically just want to pick the one that best synergizes with your champion or existing augments. Sometimes these are small stat power-ups like getting extra damage, range, keystone runes, or a dragon soul. But some can be completely game-defining, like going invulnerable when you use your ultimate, or even gaining two charges of ult to be able to cast it back to back. Because you can't can't select summoner spells, everyone is given a flash and another summoner that basically just gives a short burst of movement speed. Some augments will swap out your non-flash summoner with a different ability altogether. This includes things like on-demand kindred ult, exhaust and ignite bundled into one, as well as on-demand anivia wall, and even some more crazy things like castle, which is essentially just boogie woogie from Jujutsu Kaisen. On cast, it lets you swap places with your teammate, which as you can imagine can be incredibly troll, but in the right comp, like this Kaisa Alistar example, Alistar can all always get me to safety when the enemies want to dive on me, our solo DPS threat. It makes for some very interesting playmaking potential and can have insane synergy with teammates or your own champion. In general, the better your champ works with all of the augments available, the stronger and more consistent it's going to be. It's difficult to rank them since they can be extremely situational based on your team as well as enemies. For example, an enemy team selected an augment that essentially turned one teammate into Yumi, but in doing so, it completely shut down our comp which wanted to Mordekaiser or ult and isolate a target so Kha'Zix can kill them. This probably would have been terrible against a lot of other teams, like something that mostly just wanted to poke. But for us specifically, it was very difficult to deal with. We'll make a tier list for how generally useful these are, but definitely don't write something off just because it's low on a tier list. If it's situationally good, it just is. Because of the crazy impact these augments have, you should be pressing tab and mousing over enemy augments in order to know what to expect come fight time. This way, you can avoid being surprised and even possibly plan out future purchases or your augments to counter their selections. The augments themselves are split up into tiers, roughly divided by the impact they'll have on your game. The border around the augments shows what tier of rarity you'll be picking from, and there are three, silver, gold, and prismatic. When you're given a selection during a round, all of the augments will be from the same tier, and every team will get to pick from that same tier as well. This is completely random, so you may get to pick from prismatic augments first, last, 
anywhere in between, or even not at all. Another key feature to augment selection is the ability to reroll. When you push this button, you'll get three new augments from the same tier. It's generally good to hold these rerolls either for when you get really bad options, or the options available in the pool are incredibly high quality, like if you just wanted to see more prismatic or gold options. You only get two rerolls per match, so the decision making for when you need to reroll, or when you can just take something that's just okay, is going to be very important. In general, it's okay to wait until the second or third augment selection to reroll just because of how the rounds work, which let's conveniently segue into now. After each round, a static event will happen. This can be a guaranteed amount of gold or an augment selection, on top of guaranteed levels you're always going to gain. Here's a list of what happens in each round, but if you forget, you can always look at the top of your screen to see what bonus you'll get. You'll be randomly paired up with someone in the first round, and then after this, rotate through the other teams that you haven't faced yet. Once you've faced everyone, the cycle will repeat until someone is knocked out. The penalty for losing rounds will gradually increase throughout the game. In the first three fights, you'll be looking at losing two of your team's health, but in the next three, you'll be looking at four, then six, and so on. So even if you lose every round, it's going to take until round seven to actually get knocked out. This means that the early game really isn't that important. There are snowballing mechanics in place, such as augments that give infinitely stacking AP or gold on kill. But in general, don't worry if you struggle in the first few levels. Some comps just aren't going to be good early. The only thing your opponents will get for winning is 350 gold, which happens upon kill of a champion, and it's given to both teammates. Even if you lose the round, if you take out one of your opponents, you're going to get gold. It is capped at 350 per round, so you can't get 700 for killing both. Just aim to at least take out one person, even if you're going to lose the round to guarantee gold. This gold doesn't really even come into play until much later on, like round 8 or 9, but it will matter a lot at that point. You can potentially get an extra item upon selling your starter item, depending on if you had to sit out a round or not, and speaking of which, enemy teams that you'll fight next will be marked with a red outline. If there's no outline, you won't have a fight at all. When you know this, it can be extremely beneficial to wait to purchase your items. Let's go ahead and get into those as well. Components for items have been completely removed in this mode, and costs are standardized. Boots and starting items cost 1000 gold exactly, and everything else costs 3000. The only thing you can do with any other spare gold is purchase elixirs, which all cost 700. These vary and can give bonuses like adaptive force, ability haste, or health, and they last for one round. There is a cute one that lets you buy a hat too. These do stack contrary to Summoner's Rift, so at some point you'll have multiple of them per round. In general, because of the lack of penalty for losing early rounds, don't really buy these until you're either item capped or about to lose and have a bit of extra gold from those 350 gold kills we talked about earlier. The first few rounds, you'll be getting 1000 gold instead of 3000, and this is pretty much just to be able to purchase a starter item on the first round, and then boots in the third, which you definitely should do just to keep pace with everyone else. Unless your name is Cassiopeia, in which case, just save that gold so that when you have 2000 gold from kills, you'll be able to get another item ahead of schedule that will cost 3000. These starter items and all the boots are different from Summoner's Rift, or just don't exist. The stats are drastically changed, so make sure to actually look at what you're getting, as the items are not going to perform in the same way. Although they generally try to keep it close to avoid any confusion. As of right now, on hit is particularly strong, as attack speed is uncapped in this game mode, meaning you can get insane amounts of attacks in in very short periods of time. A lot of augments work well with this, but we're imagining that Riot will change things, so just keep an eye out. A very important idea that we briefly touched on earlier is the concept of tech items. This is basically just building to counter a specific comp. We brought up that when three teams are left, you might have a waiting period. And if you do have this, you should save your gold to wait and see who wins. If you know what team you're going to be fighting against next, this can let you be incredibly gold efficient with itemization. For example, you might not know whether to buy armor, MR, or both, but you'll get a much better idea if you wait. You can even buy something like Mercurial Scimitar against some champions that it hard counters when you know that the other team is knocked out already or if they lose hard to the other team that they have to play against. In the same vein, it can also be good to wait to purchase your item until very late into the buy phase, so you can press tab, see what other people are building, and itemize accordingly. Mythic items and passives still exist, so you are slightly limited on what combination of things you can go. Although there is an augment that allows you to purchase multiple mythic items at once, so be on the lookout for that since it could drastically change your build. Later on into the game, you will likely have a round where selling your starter item gives you the ability to purchase a full item a round ahead of schedule and definitely do so. At six items, you can also sell boots. There's a lot of move speed options available in augments as well as move speed on items like Lichbane and new old additions like Zephyr. Using these to replace your boot slot is probably going to be more value since the 3000 cost items are rather insane. Once again, we'll make a tier list for items, but remember that they are always situational and you should be adapting to your opponent's comps and builds to increase your odds of winning. Unfortunately, you can't really do any prep to prepare for specific maps that you'll be placed on. They're completely random and as of now, there are a total of four that can appear. They're all different
different in terms of size, spawning locations, bush placements, blast plants, hazards, and so on. And they have massive effects on how you need to play out the round. One of the most important differences is the location of health relics that will spawn periodically throughout the round on a short cooldown. Their respawn timer will be marked on your minimap, similar to how jungle camps are marked in Summoner's Rift. So you can tell when they're about to respawn. The location of each health plant on all the maps is marked here, and as you can tell, there are a differing amount, from 1 to 3 in each arena. These essentially act as the objective on the map, similar to Baron and Dragon on Summoner's Rift, and they really should be thought of as just as strong. The more health relics you can get, the better. There are also random hazards that can spawn in that can act as secondary objectives as well. More on both of these later. As the game progresses, a ring of fire will appear that starts to cut out the map and force teams into the center of the arena. Stepping out of this ring will very quickly deplete your health and result in a quick demise no matter how tanky you are. The ring will always close to the same location in a uniform way, so definitely know where these spots are on each map. We've marked the location to where each map closes to here. So start progressing to this spot after the ring starts closing to make sure you don't get boxed out from it. On top of a random map, each round after round 3 has a chance to spawn in with a hazard. It seems like they randomly start spawning in starting from round 4, and the odds of them appear to go up as the round counter increases. There are 5 different hazards currently all based on champions, which are Pike, Samira, Set, Lux, and Nefari. Some of these are definitely more trouble than the others, and the combination of map plus hazard can range from extremely impactful to very forgettable. We'll start with the least impactful, which is definitely Lux. She slowly rotates around from a fixed point with a red laser beam, and when this beam passes over any champion, Lux fires her ult, and then, after a short cooldown, starts her laser again and reverses the direction that she rotates. Overall, this beam is very easy to dodge, and really only an issue if you're CC'd during the cast. The most useful effect is that it reveals where targets hidden in Fog of War might be. If you see Lux fire in a direction, you guaranteed know where at least one opponent is. Progressively more problematic is Set, who takes the form of a neutral objective with health. He walks around slowly, and when his health hits zero, Set aims and casts his W in the direction that aids the team that killed him. Basically, kill Set and he'll go after your opponents. Similarly to Lux, it's pretty easy to dodge, but marginally harder for sure. This can also be used to reveal the locations of enemies, as he will aim at your opponents even if they're in fog. The next objectives are much more interesting in my opinion. Pike spawns in at a central location and will periodically launch himself at a champion with his E, dealing a lot of damage and stunning them. He always targets the character farthest away from him, so it becomes integral to get close to Pike in order to avoid this extra nuisance. He'll remain at the location he last launched to, so once he moves, you'll want to get close or just be aware to avoid him before getting into messy skirmishes. Samira is another hazard that launches herself at an opponent, although it's based off of a player-controlled action. She follows up on any CC and then dashes and gains a style stack. She extends CC similarly to how the actual champion works, and then upon getting max stacks, will ult, doing tons of damage. You want to be the person to trigger this last stack, as she will target the enemy team, similarly to how set works. By far the most annoying and impactful hazard is Nefari, who spawns in multiple dogs that patrol the arena. If anyone is spotted on these dogs, they become locked onto, and Nefari will launch missiles that do damage and slow. This makes it much more difficult to navigate terrain, and to camp certain spots. And in a very interesting turn of events, these missiles are not actually lock-on. They can be blocked by enemy champions, meaning that you can intentionally trigger Nefari and then get behind your opponent to use it to your advantage. These hazards help to spice things up and definitely contribute to the strategy that you'll need in each round. For a couple of general tips, health relics are absolutely broken. Not only do they massively heal HP and mana, they also refund cooldowns. These effects are so potent that you can completely refresh your ultimate cooldown by getting a plant, and it's almost impossible for someone to out DPS a plant's healing, even if they are hitting you the entire time. This makes champions with auto attack resets and interactions like Zeri Q very potent, since they can take plants really easily. The spawning location for your team does have a big effect on which health plants you'll be able to get easily, and which ones will take more effort. For the maps with one or two, you'll have to fight over each, but for the maps with three, maneuvering to try and win two of the three can be game changing. You should make an effort to push for control of as many plants as possible and expend your ultimate early to gain territory and space. You'll get the resources and your ultimate back if you're successful. Lower rated players are going to have a tendency to want to permanently fight and not use the relics and their cooldowns to their advantage. Try not to overchase opponents into territory unless you're sure you're going to win. Otherwise, it's generally beneficial to hold the area near the center where the ring will collapse to, as well as plant spawning locations. Different hazards have an effect on the space that is important as well. Higher levels of play can be rather slow paced and involve multiple engagements, trades, and health relic spawns. Unless your comp has the potential to end the fight in one engagement with insane amounts of damage, controlling space is going to be very important to your success. Even something like blast cones that seem rather innocuous can be used to launch players into the ring of fire or away from other health relics. 
Controlling the space around these can provide opportunities to do this, or also remove blast cones that could be troubling to you later down the road. Flash cooldowns are the only thing that doesn't get reset between rounds, and it stays on cooldown for the round after you use it. This means you have to think a little bit about when to actually use your flash, and don't waste it in a hopeless matchup, or in one that your teammate could clean up anyways without you alive. You might just regret it later. Additionally, because second place still technically counts as a win, if one comp is particularly hard to itemize against, just ignore it and play for second. The goal isn't to always come out on top, it's just to not come in third or fourth. For example, if there are two teams that are all AD and a third that's AP, just stack armor unless you feel you can easily beat them all. Similarly, if you know that a comp will struggle against the other teams, don't feel like you have to also beat them. If someone loses to two teams and only beats one, they'll drop out first, and you can largely ignore that matchup, unless you're about to be eliminated yourself. Smartly itemizing and using resources to solve the actual problems that you'll be presented with instead of all of the potential problems is something you should definitely be thinking about, and a large part of this is going to come down to team composition. Team comps are one of the most impactful things in this game mode. In draft, you cannot see what your opponents have locked in until after you've locked in yourself, so you can't counterpick at least not yet. However, you can see what they ban, so you should be waiting until the last second to ban yourself and have multiple options in mind so that you can get rid of exactly what you want. Seeing opponents' bans can give a good idea of what they might be playing and also let you not waste a ban yourself. By delaying your ban, you also don't give free information to your opponents. As far as champion selection is concerned, it can be incredibly matchup and augment dependent. Definitely try to draft champions that generally feel strong and synergize with a large portion of augments. Since you can't see your opponent's team, you also need to be able to draft to beat most kinds of comps. You definitely will just get difficult matchups sometimes, but no comp is perfect and beats everything. Again, playing for second is fine if you just realize you have a terrible matchup against one enemy in particular. Individual champions are being adjusted quickly, and I imagine that specific arena adjustments will be made on each patch, just like how Riot handles a ramp balancing. But right now, champions that provide zone control are especially oppressive. Shaco, Heimerdinger, Malzahar, Zyra, Teemo, etc. are all capable of blocking off areas and making it super annoying to enter with their traps or spawns. This gives them great control of the various objectives you want to contest and are overall a massive annoyance. Champions that abuse hybrid damage as well as on hit seem very powerful, since they can perform well with a variety of augments. So no matter what you get, you're still going to be useful. Think Kai'Sa, Jax, Twitch, etc. Because of the volatility of this, we'll definitely look to make tier lists, so check on that to keep up to date. Of course, there are certain comps that we found fun and powerful, and niche interactions can make champions good that would normally struggle on their own. For now, Rengar Ivern, Tarek Kindred, Timo Cassiopeia, and Kha'Zix Mordekaiser were all very fun and seemed to have good matchup spreads. However, you should really just think about the theme or genre of your composition, and that's going to persist through every patch, even if champions or strategies get nerfed. We can split things up into a couple of broad divisions. Poke, that aims to keep opponents away with long range and whittle their opponent's health down. Stall, something like Braum Tarek or a very tanky comp that probably won't get kills, but just aims to not die so that the fire eventually wins. Dive, looking to kill someone immediately with aggression. Hyper Carry, a traditional enchanter and carry that you aim to protect. Or All Rounder, which generally tries to do a bit of everything or just has champions that are generally strong. You can make these kinds of comps with multiple different champions, so it really comes down to what you're comfortable with. Gimmick comps are highly specific and have some niche interactions like Cassio Timo with Poison or Rengar Ivern with Bushes, but these will probably create a whole meta around countering them and will likely be good only for a little while until they're pretty well known. You can definitely abuse it while the game mode is still fresh though, and more comps will Will definitely be found over time. As with all new games, the meta will drastically change and develop, but these are the fundamentals you need to start playing and winning in the new arena mode. For everything else you need to start winning more in Classic League, go to skillcap.com. With premium courses for every role and skill taught by the best players, Skillcap is the perfect platform to help take your game to the next level. Take our wave control course. While you wait for your next game to start, you can learn freezing, fast pushing, slow pushing, bouncing waves, the list goes on, all in just a few minutes to maximize your improvement rate. Or maybe you just like seeing your opponent's health go to zero. Then you'll love our trading course. We even have a skill test at the end so you can see how good you really are. Players just like you are leaving five-star reviews and raving at how helpful they are. That's not all we have to offer though, as Every week, you release 10 brand new Smurf commentaries where a challenger player teaches you how to climb out of the exact rank you're stuck in. If you're looking for something more personal instead, then we've got you covered with one-on-one -on -one coaching from our trained challenger experts. All of this seems too good to be true? Well, don't worry. We're backed by a rank up guarantee. If you don't significantly improve while actively using Skillcapped, then you get your money back, no questions asked. So what are you waiting for? Click the link in the description below and get the rank you've always wanted. And that does it for this one. We here at Skillcaps want to thank you for watching and we'll catch you in the next one.